Hello, I'm Llewellyn Falco, the creator of Approval Tests. Have you ever had the time where you're trying to get something to work, maybe a piece of your code, maybe an API, and you start searching, maybe you search Google or Stack Exchange, maybe even your own code base, to find an example of someone else who's done something like it, and you can copy and paste that piece of code over and change it so it works for your particular scenario. Do you wish you didn't have to do that, that the API was just written so that it knew what you wanted and how to use it in a very expressive way? That's what we're going to talk about today in this section on test maintenance. Now, we've done a lot of this for common Microsoft technologies, but before I go into those in the next episodes, I want to talk about how this arises with a common sort of piece of code that I see from many developers and how you can take that and clean it up. And I think you'll be surprised in the end we get it down to about one line of code. Very expressive, very malleable. Now, to do this is going to take a little longer than normal because not only do I have to show you how to clean it up, I have to go through the process of creating it. So it's going to be a couple extra minutes than the normal videos. And in this case, I'm going to use my favorite card game, Quiddler. So let's go to the whiteboard and I'm going to start the first part of what I call the testing circle, part one, where we write the initial code. Here I have the game Quiddler, and I'm going to simplify this for the purpose of this video. I'm only going to deal with going out, none of the drawing or discarding or anything like that. And here we have two players, and each of them has a hand of four. And player number one here is going to go out by putting down the word meat. And he'll score five plus two plus two plus three for a total of 12 points for this word. After he goes out, the rest of the players get a chance to put out what they can. And in this case, player two is going to use the word math, which means the J is going to count against them. So they'll score the five and the two and the nine, but they'll lose the 13 points for the J, giving them a total of just three points. Now that we've sketched the code out on the whiteboard, the next part is to translate it into English. And I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. First, we created a new game with two players and four cards. We made for sure that the first player had the cards E, M, A, and T. And we made sure the second player had the cards T, H, A, J, and M. Player one then went out with the word meat, and player two went out with the word math. When all is said and done, player one should have had a score of 12, and player two would have had a score of three. So now that I've done the second stage of the testing circle, we're going to go to the third stage, which is translating this into code. Well, this is just going to be new up a new Quiddler game. This is going to be deal the cards E-M-A-T. This is going to be deal the cards T-H-A-J-M. This is going to be do a final play for player one with M-E-A and T. And final play for player two with M-A and T-H. You might want to notice that the TH is a single card, which is an aspect of Quiddler. Finally, I'm going to use just a plain vanilla assert to check that the score for player 1 is 12, and a similar assert to check that the score for player 2 is 3. Now that I've translated the English into code, I no longer have need for the English, so let's get rid of that. Great. Now let's give it a run and see if it works. Great. And here, I'm going to talk about where we started in. Someone has already written this, possibly even yourself, and now you have the opportunity to do a second story and you're going to use this to build on. So again, here we are with our two players and their four cards. But in this case, the first person is going to put down the word at and me. That's still going to score them 12 points, just as two separate words. And the second person is going to use the word jam, which will cost them the TH. This is going to score them 20 points for jam, minus the 9 for the TH. But in this case, they're no longer tied. He has the longest word, and that's going to give him an additional 10-point bonus. Well, I think you can see where we're going here. This scenario is going to be a lot like the previous scenario. I'll change it to two and change the individual pieces. Player one is now going to go out with the word me and the word
word at. And player two is going to use the word jam. This, of course, will change their final scores, keeping it at 12, but changing players twos to 21. Let's give that a run and see if it works. Now we need to talk about the stage of refactoring. And this is the piece that is so often missed that requires this constant need for finding sample code. As you can see, there's a lot of duplication in here. So what I'm going to do is try to take it out. What I want to do is verify a two-player game. And the first player is going to use the words me and at. That's going to score him 12 points. The second player is going to use the word jam, and that's going to score him 21 points. All right. Now, let's turn this into code. Well, first, I need to combine this into one method name. So there can really be as many words as you want. So I'm going to use a new string array to encapsulate both of the words they might use. And I need the individual letters as well, so I'm going to add spaces into my words. Likewise, I'll need to do the same thing over here. Let's create this method. The first thing is to get the variable names. So this is going to be player one's words and player one's score. And player two words and player two score. And now this is going to look a lot like what we were using up here. Some of these are easy to fix up, like the 12 is going to be player 1 score, and the 21 is going to be player 2 score. And some of them are going to lead a little more problem. This jam is really player 2's first word split on a space. But we're not sure how many words they're going to get, so we're going to have to do a for each on player two's words and split the word. Likewise, we're going to have to do the same thing for player one. Uh, and I forgot to move this down. Let's give that a format. And now you can see I have a much cleaner scenario. The ME, the AT, and the JAM, and the scores. Let's give this a run and make sure it still works. Great. You can see it's going to be very easy to do the same thing with the original process, which would make your entire test suite a lot easier to maintain. This now just becomes meat, and this becomes math. So the process here is to take the duplication out, pass in the relevant things to do the scenario, but also the relevant things to verify. And this is where this becomes tricky. You can still do this with regular verifications that come with NUnit or MS test, but it gets a lot more complicated because what you'll find is that in some places, it might be a good idea to check if they actually got penalties. And it might be interesting to check the bonus points that they got. Maybe you even wanna check what the subscores are. And what you'll find is that you don't want to make one method where you have to pass in all of this verification information. And so you're going to do slightly different things to test all of these different places. But with approval tests, you don't have to do that. Now we're going to talk about the final stage of taking a refactoring where you have the composability of approval tests. So instead of doing this assert r equals, all I'm going to do is verify the end state of the game. And you can see where Sharper is actually making these gray now, meaning that they can be deleted. This is because with approvals, you do not have to pass in 
the final state that you're verifying. Now, when I run this, I expect it to fail. And that's because I've never approved it before. But finally, we are completing the fourth stage of the whiteboard circle, where our result is mirroring the whiteboard scenario we originally sketched out. As you can see, this is scenario one, where our player one played meat for 12 points, giving him a total of 12 points. Player two played math for 16 points, but then lost 13 points from the leftover J, giving him a total of three. I can easily approve this and move on to the second scenario. In the second scenario, player one used the words me and at for seven and five points, giving him a total of 12. Player two used the word jam for 20 points, got the long word bonus of 10 points, but then lost nine points for the TH, giving him a total of 21. So very informative information in our approvals going against very easy one-line methods to call. I've done this a lot for a lot of Microsoft technologies, everything from WinForms to ASP.MVC. And we're going to talk about those in the upcoming episodes. But now you know how to do this yourself. And so if you ever come in a situation where I haven't created a method that you want, you can easily figure out how to add it. I'd like to close by highlighting Woody Zool. And to be honest, I'm surprised I've gotten this far into a series without mentioning him more. Woody's been there from the very beginning. He's an excellent coder, fantastic with legacy code, and has a particular knack for bringing teams together. He worked with me in the early days to bring it approval tests to the Compact Framework, back when that was still relevant. He actually wrote an entire port of approval tests to VBA script. And he constantly inspires me to keep my tests and code cleaner and better maintained. You can find him on Twitter at Woody Zool. As always, if you have any questions, tweet him with the hash approval tests. I monitor that and will answer you promptly.